Hello everybody and welcome to Directions Live Online. My name is Laura Berman and I am your host for today's session. Uh, so just a quick reminder that we are recording today's session and a copy um, will be made available next week so you can re-watch it or maybe share it with your colleagues too. I also just wanted to mention that we have allocated time at the end of the presentation today for a Q&A. So please do ask questions and you can do this at any time during the presentation um, by adding your question into um, the GoToWebinar panel that you'll see um, on the right hand side of your screen. So for today's session, we'll be looking at mastering the latest tools in ArcGIS Pro. So specifically, we'll be looking at the latest release, which is version 2.6.1. And joining us today from Perth and tasked with the very um, hard task of trying to narrow down all the top features of the latest release is Mary Murphy from our training and support team. So you may be familiar with Mary um, from perhaps support or training, or perhaps you've met her virtually during Art Talk at our recent Osri event. Now we do have a lot to cover, so I'm going to hand straight across to Mary um, to take it away. Thanks, Mary. Thanks, Laura. Let's get ourselves up and trying. Yeah. Thank you. Let's get up and running. Let's see. Hopefully you can all see me and see what I can That's see. Right. So excellent. Thanks, Laura. Okay, so good morning on my side of things. Maybe good afternoon where you are. Um, and let's get straight into it. So with major releases coming through so regularly, it can be difficult to keep up to date with the latest version of ArcGIS Pro not just for myself um, as an end user, but for managers that may have the decision as to which version to use and how regularly to upgrade, and IT teams that might have the challenge of packaging and deploying the software, and well, as providing you know, some technical support. So today I'm going to give you a helping hand and show you why ArcGIS Pro version 2.6 is the desktop GIS software that your organization needs to be using. Now, I'm going to split this presentation in half in the first half, I'll cover off the big six. These are the big functionality changes. And if you've heard anything about ArcGIS Pro 2.6, it's probably about these new updates. And the second half is going to be me covering off some of my favorite things, what I'm going to call the little big things. These aren't quite as huge or flashy as the big six, but I think they make a significant impact for us as end users and can make life easier for the whole GIS team. In addition, as an educator and instructor, I've spent and have spent many days working on the front line with end users. And I see what causes problems, what stops or hinders our efficiently, efficiency. And that's also why I want to highlight some of these little things. So before I get to the big six, and as we've just had Osri 2020, I want to remind ourselves of what's happened with ArcGIS Pro over the past year since last year's Osri, and hopefully provide some context to the ArcGIS Pro version 2.6. Okay, so I don't think I need to remind anyone about just how crazy this year has been. So let's focus on ArcGIS Pro. At the end of 2019 and into the beginning of this year, we were in version 2.4.2. And it may feel like a lifetime ago, but 2.5 was released just eight months ago, back in February. And version 2.6 was released following the Esri user conference back in July. And the minor release, 2.6.1, became available in September of this year, with 2.6.2 just recently released in October, just before Osri. And as always, there has been masses of new functionality added in this version, including 100 ArcGIS ideas as submitted by yourselves, the users, via ArcGIS ideas um, on GeoNet. And this includes GP tools, so your geoprocessing tools, user interface updates, new capabilities, two new layer types, and so much more. So please do continue to visit the community.esri.com, GeoNet, and continue in particular to submit your ideas. So let's get into it. The big six, who are they? So we have voxel layers, interactive suitability modeler, Graphics layers, trace networks, link analysis, and we have project recovery. So we'll begin with voxels. Voxels are three-dimensional cubes, such as NetCDF, that can store a variety of data. So the new voxel layer in ArcGIS Pro 2.6 allows you to visualize and explore multi-dimensional phenomena in a completely new way. 
So let's take a closer look at some voxel layers in ArcGIS Pro 2.6.2. So for example, here we're looking at carbon monoxide distribution in the atmosphere with data provided by the Copernicus Climate Change Service. Zooming in, we can look underneath this mushroom cloud, we can zoom, pan, navigate this 3D data. In addition, you can easily slice through the voxel volume to discover information that's hidden inside. So to do this, we're going to create a, a vertical slice within the data and move it. And what makes voxel layers so powerful is how easy it is to visualize in 3D. So let's take transparency, for example. Without it, we would be looking at a big yellow box. But with transparency, you can interactively emphasize the most important values, as we're doing here. In our next example, we'll look at a voxel layer for water temperature in the Atlantic Ocean over time. Voxel layers, they allow you to look at this data in so many different ways. So we can create sections again within this. And we can also then duplicate these sections and then we can move them around, reposition them to the point in the data that we want to look at or investigate. So when we're happy with where we've positioned them, so here, for example, we can then rotate them or tilt them. In addition to looking at these vertical sections, we can also look at horizontal sections. So we can define an isosurface and to do that, then we create this isosurface. We can create this isosurface with a specific value. So for example, we might want to set this isosurface for maybe 13 degrees Celsius, or we can also change it interactively with the slider. So we've looked at three dimensional data, X, Y, and Z, but voxel layers can also show four, dimen four dimensions. So X, Y, Z, and time. So here we've got the time slider loading up, and we can see the data as the hot water as it moves north and south as we slide. So voxel layers can be created by using publicly available data like this one from NOAA, or you can create your own using our great geoprocessing tools like 3D Krieging. An honorable mention here is the Working with Geostatistical Layers toolset, which has the new GA layer 3D to NetCDF tool that allows you to export the results of empirical Bayesian Krieging 3D tool to a NetCDF file. And this file can then be visualized as a voxel layer in a local scene to explore the re results of your 3D interpolation. Next up, we have trace networks. And with this, we have parity to ArcMap. And ArcGIS Pro is now a real option to organizations using geometric network data sets. So why another network? Well, while a utility network has a lot of advanced modeling capabilities for utilities and telecom industries, the trace network is the main component users work with to visualize, manage, and analyze simple connectivity models in ArcGIS Pro. And this includes rail, hydro, social networks. And this is the path forward with geometric networks in ArcGIS Pro. So here we can see a geometric network in the catalog pane. We cannot add it directly to a map in ArcGIS Pro, but in ArcGIS Pro 2.6 and upwards, you can directly migrate an existing geometric network using the Convert Geometric Network to Trace tool. Note you should always make a copy of the geometric network as the trace tool will override it, but the warning reminds you. So here we can see the trace network, and you can easily look at the properties of this trace network. You can enable topology, um, various properties of the trace network, and you can then enable the topology with the enable network topology tool. You can also, if you wish, start from scratch with a new network using the create trace network tool. So once you have your network, you have access to the trace network contextual tab and a number of familiar items available on this ribbon. So for example, you'll have validate, trace locations, the tools such as upstream, downstream, shortest path, etc., and display flow direction. In the trace tool, you can change the trace options, so connected, upstream, etc., uh, and you can change your output. It can be a selection or it can be a new feature layer. So again, we need to select our output at the bottom of the screen. And then we also need to put in our starting points. So we will use the trace locations tool to set our starting endpoints for the analysis to run our trace. And when you're happy and you have your starting points, you can run the analysis. And then here we have our output. Finally, you can visualize direction flow. So with the direction flow, you can set some parameters for the number of um, arrows returned. 
and then you can run it. Once it has run, you can have a look at the symbology. You can change the symbology of that layer and you can alter it. And we'll zoom in for a little bit here just to show you what that looks like. Next up, we have the suitability modeler. This is a classic GIS and remote sensing uh, workflow, and it has many applications such as planning, site selection, endangered habitat preservation. And with the addition of this interactive suitability modeler in ArcGIS Pro 2.6 and above, available via the spatial, ex spatial analyst extension license, you now have access to a dynamic exploratory environment in which to create and configure your suitability models. We're going to take a closer look at this new environment in ArcGIS Pro, but now, as you may already know, creating a suitability model is an iterative process. So we're not going to walk through an entire thing, but let's take a look at some of the functionality available to you to create a suitability model. And we'll look for some suitable locations for coffee farming in Hawaii. So using the suitability modeler, we can start our analysis after we've loaded some data. So we open the suitability modeler, and then we load a number of data sets or layers that we're going to use. So in this case, it's a number of raster layers. And we're going to overlay these and find the best areas for coffee production. Once the data is added, we can select a layer to start building our model. We won't step through the entire thing, but we will look at some of the methods of configuration, starting with the land cover data. And first, we'll get a bit of real estate back on this screen. OK. So the map shows the most suitable areas in dark green and the least suitable areas in red. In the, in the lower portion now, we have the transformation pane. And on the left-hand side of that, this shows us a histogram of the overall suitability model. In the middle is the transformation window. And this is where we make the input layer and change the land cover type to a numeric score based on suitable, unsuitable, and so on. And on the right-hand side, we will have the, oh, apologies. Ooh. Let's try that again. Excellent. And on the right hand side, we will have our window where we will try and look at that output. OK, so let's catch up to where we were. <laughs> Typical. All right. So once we have that map and we have our land class, we can then change the suitability values that we have in here. So we can change them just by typing them in and then we can calculate for our analysis. So potentially what we might want to do is look at some of these side by side. So we'll have our other first map here, the suitability map, and then we will add a second window to maybe look at some other variables that we're going to put in here. For example, we might look at some slope values within here. So slope is a continuous data set. So when we put slope into this, it will recognize that it is a continuous data set that we've added in. So we might want to use in the transformation a continuous function, such as an invert, a linear and invert it at the bottom of the window, and calculate this and add it to our model. So now we can see that the suitability map will be updated, and we can see our transformed slope will be added on the right-hand side. Again, we can close some of these windows and get some real estate back if we're happy at this point. We can change some of the thresholds. We can add some weights in here over on the right-hand side. We can add more layers that we have in and out. But what we might want is from our final suitability model that we've created earlier, we might want to select areas within those suitable areas that are of a certain size for us. So to do that, we'll use the locate tool over here on the right-hand side. And we'll select parcels of land, 640 acres. We'll select maybe two regions. We will run that and from our suitable sites, find some final locations. So the suitability modeler is very powerful and very dynamic. True end-to-end -end experience from analyzing the data to finding your optimal location. And it's a great way to learn and understand weighted overlays, all in one tool. And it'll completely change and simplify the way we do some suitability modeling from now on. So you got a quick preview, but here's our link analysis. So this is similar to functionality in other areas of the platform, such as ArcGIS Insights. Link analysis is a new interactive capability in ArcGIS Pro 2.6 and upward. 
The link analysis capability in ArcGIS Pro allows you to visualize and find clusters of connected entities, find their neighborhoods, identify paths between key entities, and common applications of this link analysis include criminal investigations, intelligence, defense and security analysis, market research, and contact tracing in the support of epidemiological response. So for example, link analysis can be used in contact tracing to explore the relationships between known COVID-19 cases and places in impacted communities to identify high-risk areas and allocate resources accordingly. So we'll take a look at this type of analysis next in our demo. So we've loaded in a fictional data set of three COVID-19 patients and their individual contacts. These were in a typical spreadsheet and then in ArcGIS Pro, we geocoded them and visualized them. So the red dots indicate confirmed positive cases, and the number in the middle represents the degree of separation from the initial cases, first, second, third. The gray dots are the trace contacts that have not tested positive at this time. So we can quickly look at some spatial patterns. So for example, a heat map, and we can confirm that there's a bit of a hotspot. If we wanted to continue our contact, anal contact analysis, we can create a link chart. This is new in ArcGIS Pro 2.6. And we now have the link chart tab available to us. So on this link chart tab, you will have some items that will allow you potentially to look at entity type, maybe relationship type, add links, explore, uh, select items, attributes, change the layout, use some display of links, and then export them. So we're going to change the layout, and that's the clustered option. We can also change it to hierarchy. So top down, for example. Maybe we want to look at left to right. So it'll help us understand how the contacts are related from the very first three confirmed cases to all other contacts. So for example, we'll look at this area and we have Willard, an original contact, an original person who contacted Colleen and then who also contacted Madeline and so on. But what about areas where there's indirect uh, positives? So indirect contacts and positives. So maybe we wanna look at this a bit deeper. So for example, we have here, uh, we have negative, 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 and then we have a positive case at the end might want to look at that further to kind of investigate these indirect contacts, cases. So we want to go beyond person to person and investigate person to place by bringing in all the places that these people visited. So we have five of these indirect contacts here, and we can see that in the center of these indirect contacts, we have a location that seems to be central for all of them. So they visited a common business. And we can put that on the map. We can select that and highlight it on the map. So that's this homeware store. So it's a local store that suggests that these individuals may have been exposed to community transmission. So once we've selected these locations, we can also put the links that we have created, that we have selected here, onto the map and actually investigate this further spatially as well. So this integration of spatial, temporal, and link analysis creates understanding for informed decisions and enables the influence of location and events to be considered when analyzing a network. Next up, project recovery. So we've all been there in the zone, working hard, flying through it, and we haven't hit save in a while. And something happens to our machine, and it's happened to the best of us. So ArcGIS Pro 2.6 and upwards now has an automatic ability to back up your project by default. In the case of a power outage, any other unexpected application shutdown, your unsaved work can now be recovered. When you recover your work, unsaved changes to items are stored in the project file, such as maps, scenes, layouts, reports, tasks, locators, are recovered up to the time of the most recent backup. The backup project seamlessly replaces the original, and a new backup project is created. So the backup project is stored in your project home folder in a folder named .backups. This is really easily set. So if you're in a project, you click the blue project tab to get you back to this open field. In the open window here, you have general then on the left-hand side. Scroll down, you have the project recovery option, and you can see that create a backup is automatically checked and that the default is set to five minutes. And you could easily change this to whatever time you would prefer. Last but no mean least, we have graphics layers. In ArcGIS Pro 2.6, we can now add graphics layers directly to a map or a map frame. Creating an ad hoc map with custom graphics and text has never been so easy and it's very fun. So these layers can include graphic elements such as points, lines, text, pictures, all of which can be modified all within one individual layer. 
They also contain spatial referencing information and can use reference scales to maintain position on the map. So let's quickly take a look at some of this in action. The Galapagos Islands are the only place in the world where penguins live on the equator. We're going to use the new map, map graphics to enhance and style this particular map. So using the new add graphics layer tool, I can insert a graphics layer with graphics and text without having to spend any time building a new feature class. So we will add that layer and we will move it down. And then clicking here gives me access to the appearance and graphics tabs and access to the tools I need. So I'm going to draw a bit of a highlight along the coastline for where the penguins live on Isabella Island. And then I'm going to change the style of this. So obviously you can save styles. I'll just use a quick default blue. And then I'd like to add some text to the map within the same layer to show that these are the Galapagos Islands. So we put in the text, we type in whatever it is we want to type. In this case, I'm going to type the Galapagos Islands. And once I've that done, I can change the color, the font, the size, the position, and so on. Again, all within this one graphics layer. So I can choose a preset one. Maybe I don't like that. Maybe I choose one I've already selected as the correct font and size and so on. Maybe I want to change the color of that as well and until I'm happy with it. Now, what makes the Galapagos Islands ecosystem really unique is these converging ocean currents around the islands. So I also have this graphic layer to show the Humboldt current and other currents that come together around the islands to bring cool water and fish for penguins. And obviously it wouldn't be complete without this one last element. So these are just a few examples of how the new map graphics in ArcGIS Pro 2.6 helps you to quickly enhance and style your maps. Okay, as end users, we all have our preferences for what's useful, helpful, interesting. As a trainer and an educator, new functionalities and possibilities are always important, yes. But when that's tied with better navigation, more intuitive interfaces for the end user, we see even more success. And of the many new features within ArcGIS Pro 2.6, I've picked out six little things that I think are big things in disguise. So we have our new raster functions. There's several new and updated ones within this, uh, and these are available with the image analyst extension. So I have in particular, these four ones that I love, CCDC analysis, compute change, detect change using change analysis, and trend to RGB. Of these, the compute change function is my favorite. It enumerates the pixel changes that occur between two raster da data sets. This function computes both absolute pixel value changes and categorical changes for thematic rasters. Game changer. For categorical changes, it generates a layer depicting all the areas that change from one class to another. So this is a huge uh, moment for change detection workflows. Next up, we have a styles and symbology change. So new color schemes have been added to the ArcGIS color system style to support bivariate color symbology. So here I'm showing them in a three by three grid form, but you can have the combination of colors in a four by four and a two by two as well. So bivariate color symbology can be used then to show quantitative differences between two fields using a two color bivariate color system. So colors in the color seam are applied to features to indicate a mixture of values from both fields. So it's a really cool way of showing your data. Edit by variate color schemes is also possible within the scheme editor. Next up, we have editing and saving web maps within ArcGIS Pro. So ArcGIS Pro provides advanced authoring capabilities for symbolizing and visualizing geospatial data. With ArcGIS Pro 2.6, you can now take advantage of this to modify and save updates to web maps in a portal, including ArcGIS Online and ArcGIS Enterprise portals. So making changes to a layer symbology and then saving those changes within ArcGIS Pro stores these changes in that web map only. The appearance or properties of the web layer in other web maps are not affected because the changes are only applied to the updated web map. Next, we have some bookmark changes. So for me as a trainer, having some bookmarks ready is extremely important and even just navigating around my scene. So now you can not, uh, dock the bookmarks window. So here I've docked it under my contents pane. And then from that, where you have the little hamburger symbol down the bottom there, you can now import and export bookmarks, which is fantastically useful. As an addition to that, with your bookmarks, you can also create a map series, as you can see here in the middle at the top, um, using these bookmarks. So you can import these bookmarks, create a quick map series from those bookmarks. 
Next up, we have features to GPX. So we already had the functionality to import GPS files. Now you can export features on a map to a GPX file as tracks or waypoints. If you're dealing with a lot of field work, this is extremely important. And last, by no means least again, we have the validate join tool. So this validate join tool validates a join between two layers or tables. The tool does not produce a join, rather it only analyzes your potential join, an exploratory join, if you will. So you can get some information about the join you are potentially undertaking and make adjustments if issues were to arise. So if you see something in there that makes you worried about your join, you can change that in your data. So this tool will then report the validation results as either messages, as you can see here, or optionally as an output table. Okay, so I've done a lot of talking. So what are your next steps? So we already have ArcGIS Pro, brilliant. So you can update, update to the new version, 2.6.2. So you do that within ArcGIS Pro. Do you have ArcMap, but not ArcGIS Pro? Well, actually you do have access to ArcGIS Pro. So get into My Esri, have a look at the My Organization tab, go to Downloads, Products, try it out now. Do you want to know some more about all this sweet new functionality? Well, if you head to what's new in ArcGIS Pro 2.6, it's a really good overview of that. And also then for the 100 ideas that I was talking about earlier, the ideas in ArcGIS Pro 2.6, a large gathering is a really good blog to um, cover off on a lot of those IT items. If you're an ArcMap user and you're thinking of making the move to ArcGIS Pro, now has never been a better time as there are no plans to release an ArcMap 10.9 with the ArcGIS releases in 2021, making it the final release of the series. So we've got you covered. Because of course, I'm going to throw some training into the mix. So we have here uh, an, a, a link for you to find your GIS courses. So esriaustralia.com.au forward slash find GIS courses. My picks to help you get started with ArcGIS Pro would be migrating from ArcMap to ArcGIS Pro, and ArcGIS Pro Essential Workflows. We also have the esri.com forward slash training location, and we have learn.arcgis.com. Finally, thank you for listening to me go on, and I'll hand you back to Laura now to see if there's any questions floating around. Thanks, Mary, and no yes, <laughs> the questions are coming in thick and fast. Um, if you have been listening to Mary intently, you still have a chance. So um, just um, pop your question in the, the questions panel. Um, but I'll get started with those. So we have a question come through from Ross who asks, I've got a quick question regarding the graphic layer. So could this graphic layer be exported as a feature class? Interesting. Uh, unsure off the top of my head. Um, I would think potentially not, um, but I can get back to you with that one. Okay, so Ross, we have all your details, so we will double check the answer and we can um, contact you directly. Thank you. Um, next question comes from Peter asking, um, how do we report issues experienced with ArcGIS Pro? So I'm thinking mm. tech support, support as a first. Yeah, yeah. yeah so definitely. Support so at azraustralia.com.au. Perfect. Thank you, Mary. Mm. Um, another question that we've had come through from Ravi. This is a good one. How do I create a voxel layer? Oh, excellent. Okay, so the really the best way to do that, because there is a number of ways to do this, and it's if any of you have worked with volumetric data or multidimensional data in the past, so anything from kind of spectral analysis to, like we saw there, temperature, um, gaseous volumes, and so on, um, you will know that there's a kind of a methodology to preparing your data for the type of analysis that you're going to take undertake, okay? So it's no different with voxels. So if you're gonna use and uh, make use of the voxel side of things, then you need to prepare the data to do so. So there is a really good set of resources on um, helping you uh, prepare your data for analysis as a voxel layer, and predominantly, you need to get the data into a net CDF format. Um, and it's not just any net CDF format. There's actually um, a set of inspection tools, so a compliance checker that we have to make sure that the net CDF meets certain criteria to be able to be used as a voxel layer. So if you actually just um, migrate to the what is a voxel layer resource for ArcGIS Pro, 
Um, underneath that, you have everything you need to help you get started. There's also a really good blog that I came across um, called Three Ways to Prepare Your Data for Voxel Layers. Um, so that's another way of working that. There are a number of geostatistical tools that, you, that I pointed out at the beginning as well to do with Krieging and so on. Um, but again, it needs to be converted into a NetCDF in order to be able to make that voxel layer. Okay, great. Thanks, Mary. Yeah. And I might, I'll grab that blog from you and I'll, yeah, when we send through a link to the recording, I'll attach the blog to that one as well. That'd be good. Okay. And someone's asking, can you post the, my pick, the web links? Absolutely. We will do that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I have another question come through from Kieran asking, can we identify the flow direction in a stormwater drainage layer? If yes, what attribute information is required in the data? So we might get, we might reach out to you directly on that one. It sounds like there's a bit of data. Oh, bit yeah, of it's a workflow. Same thing, setting up your data. So it's that, yeah. um, it's that idea of actually preparing your data to create that trace network, having the correct attributes. So it's that workflow setting it up. If you've worked with geometric networks in the past, you're probably a bit more aware of it. If this is new to you, yeah, it's a process um, of setting up the data. Data management is key. Excellent. Okay. Well, we've we have come to um, the end of the time today. Thank you, Mary, and thanks everybody for the questions that have come through as well. I'll make sure, sure we post those answers when we send through the um, the recordings. Um, so just wanted to um, mention a quick plug for our next webinar coming up on the 12th of November. So Simon Jackson will be joining us to take a deep dive into working with weather data. So he's going to look at um, you know building um, web services using the data, but also applying the data analysis into your workflows as well. Um, and also just a reminder um, to make sure that you um, head to the Osri page and check out any of the presentations that you may have missed from our virtual event a couple of weeks ago. So they're all still up on there as well. I um, also wanted to mention um, our GIS Directions podcast. Um, so if you're keen to hear more GIS chat, then go and check that out. The latest episode is a really good one. So it's called Rebranding GIS, Shifting the Conversation from Technology to Capability. So that is with um, our special guest, Adam Carnow from Esri Inc. So he actually presented at Osri. So it's um, just talking more, more to him. So he's always um, a great resource. And look out, I think next week, there's a new episode coming out um, and it's called Time Saving Hacks for Web GIS. So that's a great one to, to have a look at as well. Um, but for now, just wanted to just say thank you again, Mary. Um, it was great to have you today. Um, and thanks to everybody um, for um, tuning in today. Um, we love your feedback. So any questions or ideas that you might have, uh, about what you'd like to see, uh, a webinar topic that you might want us to show, and um, then let us know in the survey that will pop up at the end of the session today, um, or also just by emailing us at events at esriaustralia.com.au. So thanks, Mary. Thanks, Laura.